This game perplexes me. Not because this is an Oddworld game, but the game itself. First off, the B button jumps, but this is a Game Boy D make of Oddworld's Abe's Odyssey on the PlayStation. It tries to include almost all the mechanics from the PS1 game. Possession, stealth, game speak, etc. Yet rather than include all of the general PS1 game, it only includes the Paramite Trials which was about one-sixth of the PlayStation game. You travel to the Paramite Temple and do their trials. And after that I figured you would do the Scrap Trials because that's what you did in the original game. But no. You do more puzzles in the Paramount region, and then the game just ends. It's like only including the Midgar section Final Fan- Oh. Yeah. Like every Oswald game, the game isn't any normal game. It's ultimately a cinematic platformer. The controls are very slippery compared to the PS1 game. There's one hit depths and a lot more trial and error compared to the original. But checkpoints are common and there's an easy password system. But the game is only 30 minutes long. For Oddworld fans, it's interesting that this exists. For non-Oddworld fans, you're better off with the remake of Abe's Odyssey, new and tasty. I can only recommend this to Oddworld fans at a low price. I'm back with another Atari 2600 game. Missile Command. Missile Command was probably made during the height of the Cold War, at least with nuclear tensions, but the goal of the game is for you to simply uh, shoot down nuclear missiles heading towards cities. Uh, I was never a fan of the arcade game, but I do enjoy this uh, port a bit better than the arcade actually, which is something I don't say too often with Atari 2600 games. But I wouldn't necessarily call this an enlightening experience. Again, if you could get it for uh, fairly cheap, I would say it's worth it. And thankfully, most Atari games are fairly cheap. At least 2600 games are. Anyways, is this still worth the $2 I paid for it? Well, it depends on how much it holds up. Now, this is based off the 1990s Tasmanian show about the Looney Tune character Taz. I don't know anything about the show, but we don't need to know anything about this, this show to enjoy the game. The story is very simple. There's this giant bird that lays eggs and can feed a whole family. And Taz, only caring about food, goes to commit child murder, theft, and cannibalism? Okay, maybe the story's a little darker than I initially thought, but eh, let's just get to the gameplay. Actually, I'll just reenact my initial reaction to the first level. Okay, here we go. Okay. Okay, that's... Here we go. And it looks like we got a new power. I wonder what this does. Oh, that's cool. Okay, wait, wait am I in quicksand? What? You can't be serious. I didn't even know I was in quicksand. Uh, okay, let's try this again, maybe. Here we go. Okay, just button mash through it. Okay. What's this do? Oh, hey, extra life. Okay, now let's see where uh, this takes me. What? Okay, first off, why is there momentum in this game? My own Sonic had momentum, but in those games, especially Sonic, you move really fast in those games. Here, you just walk. It makes the controls feel more sluggish. You can also spin, and I know I just complained about the slow walking, but man, this is too fast. Like, level design and camera are not designed around the speed. Spe speaking of which, as you might have guessed from my reaction, the level design is full of cheat tricks, and there are a lot of them in this game. But there are also these bombs that take away half your health, and they're everywhere. It won't be so bad, but they use them for gotcha moments like putting them behind foregrounds or just tricky spots to avoid. Also at times, the level design is just illogical. You've seen that one of the water pills leads to a death trap? But the one after that is required to beat the level. You also have to take leaps of faith, it's not always clear where you have to go, and it's not always clear what hurts you. Bottom line, there's a lot of trial and error. 
However, once you know what to do, the game does get noticeably better, and you know what, the graphics are not great, but I imagine they are like the cartoon, and Taz's animations are fun to watch. The music is... bad, but is tolerable. It uses gems, which is kind of funny because the developers of this game, Recreational Brainware, also create gems. This is the only game that they ever developed. I suppose if you were a kid in 1992 and you had this in Sonic 2, I suppose this would have been adequate enough. And like I said, if you figure things out and put up with it, it does get a little better. However, I recommend that you don't put up with it and play Sonic 2 instead. I mean, it doesn't get that much better to make it worthwhile. With that said, I'll give this a 1 out of 5. Today, I am looking at the Famicom version of Tetris. It's Tetris. However, I guess I can't be that lazy. It's different than the one we know. The history behind this game is kind of complicated. This game is not a great version of Tetris. The game uses one button, and that's to drop the pieces. Guess what? You use the down arrow to flip the pieces. I know this is one of the earliest versions of Tetris, but what lunatic thought this was a good idea? Yeah, just stick with the NES version we all know. Alright, it's a double review of Pilot Rings and F-Zero on the Super Nintendo. Pilot Wings is really just a series of flying minigames. It is more just a tech demo for the Mode 7 graphics. I'm not really a fan of this game, but I'll just say it's not for me because I know there are people who do like this game. F-Zero is also a tech demo for Mode 7. This time, it's a futuristic racing game, which is something I can get behind. It's actually pretty fun, but it can be pretty difficult. This game hasn't aged great, but it's still enjoyable. Sonic R. Does it still hold up? Well, technically this is Sonic's Gems Collection, but it's a perfect port. And I'm going to be emulating it. Sonic R is a racing game. Almost everyone online hates this game. I actually somewhat enjoy this game. There are a lot of problems with this game. Some I can somewhat defend. One is the controls. It's classic tank controls along with an accelerate and brake button. On top of that, another problem is that you turn too slow and that there are turns that are difficult to do without slowing down. Now, this isn't as bad as it seems. These are basically driving controls except you can turn while you're standing still and jump. But since almost everyone is on foot, it's a little awkward. Although I will agree turning is a little too slow, even with the best character. Also, I would agree that the tracks are not the most well designed. It's like the people who made these tracks designed them without knowing how the controls were laid out. There is also only 5 tracks, which is kind of dumb. There are more characters than tracks, and unlocking these characters may give the few tracks, or the whole game, more value. However, this creates another problem that is often criticized. The balancing is really bad. Sonic is probably the best, but there's also Super Sonic as an unlockable, which is pretty much cheat mode, and ironically fixes the slow turning issues. Then there is Amy, who just sucks at everything. However, honestly, I still find enjoyment in this game despite all its problems. The graphics are quite impressive when considering the Sega Saturn's hardware. The music, as everyone has said, does not fit the game, but honestly, I kind of find it a guilty pleasure of mine. It does add enjoyment to this game. Now, there is no reason for you to buy Sonic R by itself. But what I can recommend is Sonic Gems Collection. Sonic Gems Collection is a follow-up to Sonic's Mega Collection. Although not quite as good as Mega Collection, Gems Collection is still fairly solid. It has some good games on it, just not as many as Sonic Mega Collection Plus. I would recommend this if you enjoyed Sonic's Mega Collection. So with that, I give Sonic R a 2 out of 5. It's problematic, but it's kind of fun, and I would give Sonic's Gems Collection a 4 out of 5. It's fairly good, but it's a bit lacking compared to Sonic Mega Collection. At the very least, was re-released on the Wii U.
But does it still hold up? The game is a reboot of the series as the continuity between this and Kanoa 2 doesn't quite add up. The story is that Kanoa was having dreams, however Kanoa gets arrested and is brought to the Empire. Turns out dreams are illegal in this kingdom and viewed as worthless. Kanoa refuses to accept that and Kanoa is offered a challenge to rid the kingdom of his problems. However, Kanoa and his partner Hugh Pell discover that a lot of the problems originated by dreams. So they have to figure out what's really going on. The cutscenes are amazing, very dynamic and fun to watch. The graphics as a whole are excellent for GBA standards. The core mechanics of Kanoa 1 and 2 are still here. You can grab enemies to throw or use them as a double jump. Again, that's one way to solve your problems. You can still float as well. Some enemies have different reactions when you grab them. However, the overall layout has changed. Like Kanoa 2, the game is a puzzle action game. However, there are more puzzles here than Kanoa 2. There are five worlds. Instead of fewer longer levels, Empire of Dreams has main levels but are shorter. I actually like this over Kanoa 2. However, instead of going from one location to the next, you have to collect three stars throughout the level in order to open the exit. The puzzle is figuring out how to get to these items. There are less enemy types in the previous game, but there are blocks which do add a bit more variety to the puzzles. However, repetition does set in a little, but it's still fun. There are also one slime level and one auto-scoring level in each world. These are completely optional unless you want to unlock the extra levels. Boss fights are not as fun as before. They seem to be more designed to show off the GBA's capabilities, but honestly, these are the weakest part of the game for me. However, the game is overall enjoyable and highly recommended. I give this a 5 out of 5 just like Kanoa 2. Three Activision Atari 2600 games. Not a bad deal. The thing about Activision Atari 2600 games is that they're usually never inferior arcade ports. So there is some reason to still play them today. Some of these games are fairly ambitious for their times. And most are just overall fun. The menus are also very nice. The only problem is that sound effects in some of these games were changed to have more realistic sound effects. That may not necessarily be bad, but there is no way to change them to the original from what I can tell. Otherwise, this is an excellent compilation. There is sort of a sequel about Intellivision games. F-Zero X is faster and more intense than the first game. The graphics are not in 3D. The graphics are simple, but it is done to allow 30 races on a track to twist and flip and all runs at 60 frames per second. However, it's just as hard as the first game. However, it is a fun sort of hard. You have an N64 and you don't have this game? Why? What are you doing? It's more fun even with the N64's awful controller. The first thing you'll notice about this game is the graphics. They are a bit rough and have less color than the original Amiga version, but this part has all the cool layers of scrolling. Also, the art style is just cool. 
there are many uniquely designed enemies. Many Psygnosis games look like this. Unfortunately, the port goes downhill from here. The music was awesome in the original Amiga version. The music in this port is terrible. The compositions are nice since they're based on the original Amiga game, but not only are the instrument qualities very poor, but for some reason the music is sped up. I mean, listen to this. Also, well, the developers kind of forgot to put in a punching sound effect when he hit the enemies. However, remember when I said that the original game was known for its graphics? Oh, well, let's just say it's not known for its gameplay. As you might have seen, your attacks don't have much reach, and enemies fly at you. It's very easy to take damage. Now, you have a beefy life bar, and this is something you can get used to a little. But what makes it so bad is that not only do you have one life, but you have very few chances to get your health back. You do get a few weapons throughout the game, but they're only temporary, and the game makes sure to counter this to keep the difficulty up. What makes this worse is that like another world, you need a guide to figure out what to do. Some of these levels can branch out, and if you don't do the right thing, you can end up with a dead game. It doesn't help that the game is designed to appear open, but you need to complete it linearly. However, even with all of this, the game only takes 20 minutes to beat. The game is all memory, and even if you get a low explorative, you will die in this game. And even if you're willing to put up with all of this or use cheats in a guide, this is what you get for beating the game. Screw this game. If you really want to play this, just play the original Amiga version. This one for a while was probably the more accessible version, but, but the original Amiga version was included in the 2016 remake. Yeah, just don't bother with this. At least this version. Anyways, the first Mario Tennis game. But honestly, you can remove the Mario theming from this game because it's just a standard tennis game. No power-ups, nothing. In fact, all you can really do is play singles or doubles matches. There's really not much content to this game. There are several playable characters, but all what they do is just change the backgrounds. The core gameplay is alright, but I found myself shutting off the game, not due to headaches. I never had an issue with the Virtual Boy's 3D, especially when you set it to the right settings. I'll even actually admit that the 3D is really good, but it takes so long to win a match. I just find myself getting bored of it. Supposedly you have to win 6 rounds to win, I think. Yeah, no thanks. With that, I'm still waiting for Mario Combat. Today is going to be the Revenge of Shinobi on the Sega Genesis. Revenge of Shinobi is an action side-scrolling game that came out fairly early in the Genesis's life. The game is fairly hard, but fair as it does feel tactical. The game's controls feel tight, which is good as you need to move fast if you want to get anywhere in this game. Your shurikens have a limited use, but if the enemies get too close, you will use a melee attack instead. If you have a Genesis, this might be a game you might want to check out, even with the somewhat high difficulty level, as long as you bring some skill or keep trying, the game can be a lot of fun. The music by Yuzo Koshiro is really enjoyable. It has a lot of enjoyment to this game. Today, I am doing a quick review of Miss Pac-Man on the Game Gear. Also, yes, I finally cut my hair. This Pac-Man on the Game Gear feels very similar to Pac-Man on the Game Boy. Like that version, you can swap between a close-up for more detail or a zoom out. The thing with Miss Pac-Man is that it plays a lot faster than the original Pac-Man. 
However, this version plays fairly slow to the point where it just feels like regular Pac-Man. Now, maybe it's just I suck, but I have problems getting this Pac-Man to go where I want to. This led to some frustrating deaths. Again, it could just be me. But really, you're better off with really any other version of Pac-Man than this version. It's not overall bad, it's just there's no reason to play this today. Global Defense, or SDI in the arcade, is definitely an interesting game. Earth is under attack from missiles from space. It's a space shooter, but it doesn't exactly play like one. You play as a satellite that shoots in all directions. The controls may be a little awkward since you have to hold a button to move, but it is manageable and you also don't need to move that often. The game is more about defending planets. You have to shoot down missiles and other enemies before they reach the end of the screen. There's a damage mirror at the bottom, and let's just say you don't want it to get full. There are two segments in each level. And the first is the offensive segment. It's more like a space shooter and you can die in these segments. Then there's the offense segment, where it's more like missile command. You can't die here. But the damage meter from the offensive segment carries over and there's a lot of missiles here. This is definitely hard, but it is one of those fun kinda hard, like the Revenge of Shinobi. Like Rambo First Blood Part 2 on the same system, whenever you die you do get to reposition yourself. It's pretty chaotic which makes it very fun. The only thing I didn't like is that you can only destroy things if they're on your cross here. You can't just shoot in the general direction. Although, the hit detection is generous. Honestly, if you have a Sega Master System, this is one that you should consider owning. Very simple, yet very fun. Honestly, I think this game deserves a bit more attention. Hey. Did you guys know that Dig Dug 2 is a thing? You wanna know something else? Apparently Dig Dug 1 was never ported to the NES. Yet weirdly Dig Dug 2 was. So yeah, Dig Dug 2, Trouble in Paradise. The game is different than Dig Dug 1. This game is an overhead arcade game. Like the first game, the goal is to kill all enemies. You still have the pump from the first game, but now you have a jackhammer to destroy parts of the island? Wait, what? I thought I was supposed to be saving paradise, not destroying it. Wow, you have weird ways of solving your problems. At least Kaloa doesn't take up that from you. The jackhammer can be a bit tricky to use, so don't get too reckless with it. The game is just an endless high score game. Outside of the graphics, this plays identical to the arcade version, and considering that this game doesn't get ported a lot, this version holds up fairly well. As a game itself, it was kind of fun. I can at least kind of recommend that you check this out. One thing I got wrong in the original review was that I claimed that you had to have the console on before holding on the re reset button and then turning it off and then back on to get the glitch to work. In uh, actuality, you just have to hold down the reset switch before turning the system on. And that's how you get the glitch to work. The main thing I neglected to talk about is that you can actually change the game modes in this version. For example, you can either have your cannon be bigger, you can have the barriers move, you can have the enemies shoot more aggressively, or you can have the enemies be invisible. This, to be fair, does give this version a bit more variety compared to the arcade version. And this might actually change the score from a 2 to a 3, because this does actually give the game a lot more variety, unlike the arcade. Anyway, that's really all I kind of have to say about this, so anyways, I'll see you guys next time.